Thank you very much, uh, members of the media. Bulabinaka, and a uh, very happy new year to all of you. <coughs> Thank you for joining us today. I'm here today with the Permanent Secretary for Health and Medical Services and also with the Commissioner for uh, Police with uh, two simple messages uh, for the nation and that's uh, to get boosted and to get back to the basics of COVID safety. And we have some new uh, policies to announce in support of both these objectives. As we all know, ladies and gentlemen, Omicron, the fast spreading variant of COVID-19 uh, that has become rampant around the world has been confirmed as, as uh, being present in Fiji. And we both predicted and uh, prepared for the new variants of, of this particular virus and we'll be stepping up enforcement uh, of key measures that can actually slow down the spread. First of all, I wanted to echo some of the, uh, uh, Dr. Fong's previous uh, assurances that we are up against a different disease in Omicron, uh, and as one of the most highly vaccinated nations in the world, we are quite capable of getting on with our lives and with our recovery. We do not face a false choice between lives over livelihoods uh, or health over education. And some people may want us to feel that way, but the science actually says otherwise. We can have a functioning economy, as you all know, and whilst respecting the basic rules to keep us safe. Um, we can continue to rely on the excellent protection that has been given to us by the vaccines. And we can strengthen that protection by administering booster doses, um, as we are doing, and that uh, we must remember that, ladies and gentlemen, the time for lockdowns, uh, targeted or otherwise, and other heavy-handed policies is in the past. And from a health and, and an economic standpoint, such measures would be self-defeating. Here's what we know. An overwhelming majority of people are infected with the Omicron, we will make, uh, the, but they will make a full recov recovery at home. And this variant produces a significantly less severe form of disease uh, than the previous variants. And while the variant is more likely to evade uh, vaccines to infect us, it is far less likely to make us severely ill. I'm sure you've heard all of that from Dr. Fong. And especially given the powerful protection against severe disease and death offered by vaccines. However, the highly transmissible nature of this variant is of concern, as it is to all other countries around the world. Because some people, particularly adults who are not vaccinated and vulnerable adults, adults who are not boosted, can still get very sick. And by infecting many people very quickly, this variant can actually uh, place a serious burden uh, on our hospitals and make non-COVID treatment uh, more difficult to access. This is happening in many other advanced countries uh, uh, and many countries around the world. But while Omicron can actually spread at lightning speed, it is not impossible uh, for it to slow. And we have to, to slow its spread until we get more Fijians boosted. And uh, that means three doses of, a, of the vaccine. Our Honorable Prime Minister has uh, asked us all adults to make getting boosted their New Year's resolution. And we urge every adult to come forward to get their booster jab uh, if it's been five months since your second dose. Uh, in the meantime, as individuals, and as businesses, uh, we, uh, and as a society, we need to get back to, to the basics of COVID safety and to curb the irresponsible behavior that could place hospitals training numbers of vulnerable Fijians uh, at risk of infection. Our plan, ladies and gentlemen, relies uh, on proven and proportionate measures, not performative ones. And it is, a structured, it is structured around preserving the future we have worked so hard together to uh, to make possible for ourselves. The education of our children and the functioning of our economy are essential to the health of the nation and now and also for generations to come. We have to adjust, we must, we have to adjust as a society to protect those vital aspects of our lives and of our future. And getting back to the basics of, of uh, COVID safety includes, it includes regular was uh, mask wearing and uh, strict physical distancing and the avoidance of unnecessary crowds. It's not enough to have these uh, rules just on the books. They must be followed by everyone everywhere. We would much prefer that everyone voluntarily uh, follow these basic rules 
uh, and basic steps to limit the spread of the virus. We are two years, and I'll say that again, we are two years into the pandemic, and we should be able to count on everyone's common sense and compassion to adhere to the basic norms of COVID safety. As Fijian citizens, we have to be responsible. And whether you're a leader or whether you're a parent or whether you're a religious head or whether you're an employer or an employee, we are all in this together and we all owe the nation our vigilance. As government, our responsibility to everyone is to provide vaccines to protect you and to provide medical support for when people do fall ill. Our responsibility is to create the safest uh, mechanisms that will allow you to go back to work for, and for businesses to remain safely open. And we're actually doing that. But as citizens, you too must shoulder our national responsibility of keeping everyone around us safe. This responsibility applies every day and it extends in the greatest and even in the smallest of ways. If you enter a supermarket without a mask, you put our health system at risk. If a business skips a vaccine check, uh, a check system at the end of the day, you're actually putting somebody at risk. You put our health system at risk, and that's very, very important for everybody to remember. And these reckless actions can add up to actually overwhelming our health system because non-compliance by all of us individually has a far-reaching society-wide impact that affects us all. So should our uh, sense and sentiment fail us, we are announcing a new um, slate of fines and penalties to ensure strict adherence to our COVID safe measures. Because the variant uh, does not present the same level of threat to our highly vaccinated population, the majority of our previously announced uh, health measures are not changing. We are not locking down any communities. The curfew isn't changing. All of that has been subject to speculation, but I can put that to rest now. Curfew isn't changing and businesses are not being uh, shuttered. The borders aren't closing. Schools are not closing either. But we are stepping up enforcement and penalties for violations of health measures. The school closing issue, I just wanted to spell out that if it does, if there is an issue that's been uh, taken up by NDMO Ministry of Education, it would be because of uh, the pending uh, uh, bad weather. Let me remind everybody of the, the rules that, uh, that we have in place. Uh, firstly, all public service uh, vehicles must operate at 80% capacity and ensure that all passengers are wearing masks and, and inter-island vessels must also operate at 80% capacity and ensure that all passengers must wear masks. It shouldn't be a case of you know, bus operators saying that, oh, it's the public's fault or public saying it's the bus op op operator's fault, they should be policing it. It's everybody's responsibility. 80% is rule. High businesses also, uh, high risk businesses, must verify vaccination status of the visitor, the client or the customer, using the VaxCheck tool and adhere to COVID safe practices. Businesses and officers also must, first of all, display a QR code and ensure that staff and visitors and customers scan before entering the premises. A manual register must be maintained and for those who don't have a smartphone. And secondly, prominently display all at all points of entry a signage on the maximum allowable capacity and ensure that all COVID safe measures are followed. We also, uh, thirdly, we must conduct symptom uh, screenings and temperature checks for visitors, clients and customers on the business premises. You've all heard this before, but it's a gentle reminder that we must continue to do this. And to ensure that these rules are reliably followed, we have a new uh, restriction uh, for informal social gatherings. And I repeat, informal social gatherings. The issue is that we cannot effectively regulate all of these informal spaces to ensure mask wearing, distancing, and other COVID safe practices in order for us to continue to have our children learning in their schools and for our people to continue to uh, go to work in the, to, their, to their jobs, we have to mitigate the risks that emanate from our informal meetings. So from, from tomorrow, these informal gatherings in homes and in communities and community halls 
will be limited to 20 persons. Please understand what is actually being said. It is informal gatherings. Our other venues, which have been approved to operate under COVID safe measures and or uh, which require KFAG commitment certification, including places of worship and restaurants, uh, can host events, including weddings and other functions at 80% capacity. So therein is the difference. I hope you all understand that. But, which, but, but those which do not have formal approval or certification to host events, uh, you must, come, um, must become KFEG commitment uh, certified to do so. Please, I invite those that haven't got it to please do so. The enforcement and penalties, ladies and gentlemen, we will not hesitate to find people and revoke permits uh, to operate or to shut down businesses, including hotels that blatantly disregard any of these COVID safe measures. The enforcement agencies uh, are the Ministry of Commerce, Trade, Tourism, Transport, the Ministry of Health and Medical Services, the Fiji Police Force and the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission. As of the 10th of January 20, uh, 2022, the following fines, uh, amongst other enforcement measures, will apply for, for a failure to wear a mask or face covering in required settings will result in a spot fine of $250. Businesses failing to maintain records or, or have QR code available for scan can be fined up to $1,000. The business and the official responsible will also get charged. A failure to undertake symptom and uh, temperature checks will incur a $250 fine uh, for individuals and a $1,000 fine for the business. High-risk businesses also uh, failing to verify vaccination status will face a $1,000 fine, whilst the official responsible for undertaking that task or in charge of the premises at the time will be fined $250. Public service vehicles uh, and not complying with capacity requirements will face the following fines. The driver will be charged $100, $100. passenger $100, permit holder or company $1,000. In addition, the permit holder or company can face a $4,000 $4, fine for not following the protocol for land transport services. Failure to also comply with the relevant protocols will lead to fines of up to about $4,000. And a business that is issued one infringement notice could face double the fine or for the second notice together with a closure of business. This is actually a final warning uh, to everyone that non-compliance will simply not be tolerated. We expect that these new fines remain in effect for at least the next several weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, our borders are open. We have Fijians who are uh, back at work for the first time in nearly two years. We will do everything possible to protect their employment. That means protecting everyone. And it means that the same rules that apply to locals will apply to tourists as well. And visitors should be able to enjoy their holiday in Fiji uh, with the best Fijian hospitality and at the, at the same time feel safe that they can return home on time. So far, test positivity among tourists uh, remains very low, and we do not view hotels as, a major, as major drivers of transmission, and tourism operators must continue to comply with the CFC uh, commitment and the tourism uh, operation protocols. They, continue, they can continue to enforce measures as they have been doing on the hotel premises. Ladies and gentlemen, you simply put, you should follow these rules not because we demand it of you, but because, uh, uh, or we will find you, but because they are proven to work at protecting you from contacting COVID-19. So please get boosted and get back to the basics of COVID safety uh, so we can actually get through this challenge together uh, and get on with our economic recovery. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, that COVID isn't the only threat that Fiji faces at the moment. Please stay safe. Uh, from the wet weather and the bad weather that has come around. And in case of evacuation, we have well, well rehearsed protocols uh, for managing the movement of people and, uh, and supplies without giving the virus more chances to spread. So please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, adhere to the advice from the authorities. Thank you very much. I'll just hand over now to uh, Dr. Fong, who's got a short uh, uh, delivery of his, his notes. Thank you, Minister, and Bolivia uh, Fiji. The uh, Ministry of Health and Medical Services uh, continues to record lower than expected uh, hospitalizations due to COVID-19, despite uh, what we appreciate is a significant resurgence 
in COVID-19 cases throughout uh, Fiji. This is good news. In fact, uh, because we are decoupling or we are breaking the relationship between cases and uh, hospitalizations due to COVID-19, uh, this particular uh, finding is now is actually represents something that's even more dramatic than what it than what appears on paper. You know that the total number of cases that we are recording is an underestimate of the current problem. We appreciate it. We know that it's an underestimate. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that we are not downplaying the problem. The problem is that we will not be able to test every single body who has a flu-like illness. We don't have the test to do it. Neither do we have the capability to follow up all those positives. And it's not only in Fiji, it's present throughout the whole world. So people need to stop making Fiji as if it's unique in that behavior. We know it's an understatement because also that the number of, from all the tests that we conduct, we have a high percentage of the results are positive. And this is what we call the positivity rate. If you look at our last night's positivity rate, it was around 40%. So we know, in our, we know very well, and we thought that we had schooled everybody into the idea that once the positivity rate goes up, the numbers we're reporting is an understatement. We've been through this battle before. We've told people over and over about this current thing. So please, let's appreciate this, uh, the, the way that the reports are going and the fact that we will have limitations in reporting case numbers. While Omicron may be mild, for nearly everyone it infects, its faster rate of transmission means that it may not be mild for the health system. Because even if the percentage of people who require hospitalization due to COVID-19 may be lower, as is seen with many other countries, there are many amongst us who are unvaccinated, who have underlying health conditions that may, and also who are not boosted, and they can suffer severe disease and burden our health system, much as what the minister has just said. I want to be clear that even without Omicron, we were expecting a third wave. We expected it from the way we saw the behavior happening in the community. We knew it was coming without Omicron. And I knew that my team repeatedly made that warning uh, once we got a handle on our second uh, wave. We must also remember that Omicron is likely not our last variant of concern. There's also, there's already other variants that people are talking about that science, the scientific community is discussing. This tells us that we need to adapt our approach to confronting the virus. It most certainly tells us that we cannot apply our old containment response to take on new variants. Our task now is to find an approach that is, that is able to control the disease incidence and the hospitalization. And that approach has to be pragmatic, ethical, and sustainable for people's livelihood. As Permanent Secretary of Health and as a doctor, I am fully aware of the implications of this variant, particularly its potential to impact our health services. But I also find it quite inhumane, impractical, and unnecessary to force people into lockdown when we know that the lockdowns do not work well against highly transmissible variants. And once again, that's something that I have repeated over and over again in all my, uh, all my statements. Therefore, there are two pillars to our approach. One is vaccination, including the boosters. Vaccines provide life-saving protection against severe illness from this variant. We must also get two doses. Plus, as soon as, the booster, as, soon as you are eligible for a booster, get another booster. And the booster is you become eligible when you're about five months after the second dose. The second pillar of our approach is prudence. We, will, we must continue to use proven, good, common sense measures to limit the spread. As the minister put it, we must get back to the basics of COVID safety. I want everyone to understand how our thinking has evolved in step with the la latest uh, scientific findings. 
given the high transmissibility of the variants Delta and o Omicron, knowledge of case numbers and case distribution is less useful to determining what measures we'll take to protect the public from exposure to COVID-19. Okay, like when we started, we highlighted the numbers, we highlighted where they were distributed because we thought we would be able to get you to navigate those areas. Now, because it's so transmissible, that it becomes a pointless discussion. Because you run away from here, you go back to another place where you got the same amount of transmission. Doesn't make any difference. Other factors like hospitalizations to COVID, uh, due to COVID-19 are now much more important. The situation has changed and our thinking and analysis must change with it. I believe we should move away from making front page news out of the case numbers. When these numbers have become significantly yes, less useful for our own decision making. What matters with regard to this variant is hospitalizations due to COVID-19 and ICU admissions due to COVID-19. Both of these numbers are low. We have achieved high vaccination in those most likely to be infected. And we have also fully vaccinated. We have also fully vaccinated 90% of persons over the age of 15. Remember, before I used to report above the age of 18. Now I can confidently report above the age of 15. 90% coverage already. The immunity that has been built through vaccination, together with the number of people who have gained some immunity due to prior infection, means that the vast majority of people infected by Omicron will have manageable diseases, illness, and can recover from home. However, there are people who are still vulnerable to severe disease, even if they are fully vaccinated. We need to ensure that those, these vulnerable adults receive their booster dose. Until we achieve wider booster coverage, our focus now must be to suppress transmission through basic measures like masking, physical distancing, in order to protect these vulnerable uh, Fijians. And they include uh, persons over 50 years, those with underlying health conditions, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, asthma, those who are obese, and those uh, women who are pregnant. Therefore, we will continue to prioritize testing where it's going to make the difference to patient outcomes. That means all our testing must be focused on people at higher risk of severe disease and death. When a person who we identify as a vulnerable person tests positive within the Ministry of Health facility, they are then put into a care pathway where care can be escalated, monitoring can be escalated so that they have timely access to good care whenever they have severe signs. People who are not at high risk from this virus, meaning those who are fully vaccinated and or boosted above, uh, below the age of 50, they have no underlying health conditions, they have a, set, a different set of protocol. If you fall in this category, you have, and you have any COVID-like symptoms, you must assume you have the virus. You can take the test if you want just to confirm it, but it will not make a, any difference to the action that you take. Because even if the test, even if the rapid diagnostic test is negative, you still need to go to isolate. If you got a flu-like uh, illness and you do the RDT and the RDT or the rapid test is negative, don't think that you haven't got COVID. Sorry, you have to go into isolation. So it is the symptom, especially in those who are less than 50, got no comorbidities, the symptom defines your status. As I said, if you do, a test, if you do test positive or you develop COVID-like symptoms, our advice is for you to self-isolate at home, and this is the change that we're making, self-isolate at home for seven days. Okay? You should begin your own seven-day isolation period from, your, from the day you test positive, that's if you have no symptoms, or from the day your symptoms begin. If you need to leave home for any essential purpose, then we ask you to please wear a mask. Complete your essential business that you have and go straight back home. We cannot force you to keep to yourself at home as much as possible. We cannot keep you from meeting your friends. 
We cannot even count the number of days for you. Instead, we are only counting on you to be responsible enough to follow the rules and slow the virus. If you are not expecting, uh, if you are not ex experiencing any of the severe symptoms, there is no testing required at the end of our seven-day isolation protocol. So essentially, we're saying that if you're asymptomatic at the end of seven days, you're done. But still, you have to keep wearing your mask because everybody has to wear their mask. And the, uh, as I said, you, when you engage in the public, after you have finished your isolation, you move around in the public and isolate your mouth and your throat away from the rest of the public as much as you can by wearing a mask and wearing it well whenever you're going around. Contacts now do not need to uh, self-isolate, but they should continue to monitor themselves, wear the mask properly, and if they uh, become sy uh, symptomatic, go into isolation. So you see there's a difference. If I have so much transmission in the community, all of us are contacts. So if I was to say everybody go into quarantine, that means everything stops. We cannot afford to do that anymore. And part of the reason why we're doing this is, of course, because as I said in the beginning, we've decoupled cases and hospitalizations due to COVID-19. The festive season has brought significant movement of people as families have reunited to celebrate Christmas and New Year. We know there have been gatherings where COVID-safe measures have not been followed. And people have attended gatherings where, while they're still having symptoms. We ask everyone to continue your observance of your COVID-safe measures. And if you have relaxed them, please resume them right now. Even at home with your guests. If someone is coughing and sneezing around your grog bowl or your dinner, uh, dinner party, politely or maybe more firmly tell them go home go away stay away for the recommended number of days that we say the ministry of health and medical services is also acutely aware of the medium to long-term health impacts of a depressed economy and the prolonged poor access of our children to education make no mistakes both of these two actually have an impact on the health of people in much the same way as COVID-19 has had an impact on the health of people. We need our economy that can sustain, we need an, an economy that can sustainably function and we need our children back at school. Speaking from a health perspective, I know that without this, the health of our people will be negatively affected for years to come. We will continue to support tourism and the education sector to navigate this difficult path to better economy and better education standards because we understand that our long-term health as a nation is dependent on both these sectors as well as other vital sectors that Fiji depends on to thrive. Parents should feel confident that the students are safe in their classrooms due to the effectiveness of the COVID safe measures and the practices in school. Together with that, we need in within society, we need the social gathering restrictions as announced by the Minister to be in place. In every public setting, including school, good habits can protect us from COVID-19 and the many variants that we expect to come to our shores, as well as many other debilitating and other deadly infections, respiratory infections, that are either now here or are yet to come. In conclusion, we need to be guided by the evolving uh, knowledge of this disease and the ways that the new knowledge is being interpreted and the protocols are being amended, especially by our, with, it, with other countries who have a bigger group of people that can look at it, you know, more expertise to look at protocols. They've made their amendments. They've applied the science. Okay? So I think one of the things that I, I need to be very, uh, very clear about is, for us, the science has not really changed. What we have to do is that because we've made some distinct changes in decoupling cases from severe disease, we need to start making moves. Because there are many more threats to come and this is not a short-term gain. We are, in, we are actually in a very capable uh, position to contend with this current wave. Our vaccination uh, coverage is high and our population is relatively young. I know there are those who are impatient for change and concerned we might be too slow to move forward. 
and there are others who are anxious at the idea of opening. We believe that our current approach will satisfy the concerns of both sides. The virus is in the community. Our response is changing as it must. And we need to be on track to live with the virus while we control the disease as soon as possible. Okay, we need to have all the measures that allow us to live with the virus and at the same time control the disease. And not only do that, but we need to do it quickly. We can't go on a slow burn anymore. We need to take on that responsibility ourselves. In order for this to happen, we need to maintain our high vaccination rates, get the booster dose when we become eligible, and we need to support each other to develop COVID-safe habits into our daily living routine so that we do not have to rely on mandates and enforcement measures to stay, stay safe. We should all know by now that COVID-19 is not going away. It will stay with us. But we don't need to panic. We need a plan, and we've always had one. We'll make changes to the plan every time there is a need. If we are all responsible and we stick to the plan, we'll get through this all together. Thank you. Good afternoon and Happy New Year, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as intimated by the Minister uh, and the Permanent Secretary for, for Health, I'll be very brief. It basically calls for responsibility. If you are responsible, you need not worry about heavy fines uh, and being processed uh, through the legal mechanisms that are in place. That has been reviewed. Uh, we've observed things from an enforcement perspective. We've ori reorientated ourselves. We've decided on actions to take and we will act on that in line with what has been intimated by the Honourable Minister this afternoon. We are also looking at uh, things that have been issued before and how we can process that through, uh, through the system so that we can deal with those irresponsible people. It calls for responsibility rather than, uh, than anything else. Uh, I'll, I'll take you through a scenario. I walked into a shopping centre. Uh, and a mother and three daughters uh, are walking in with one of the daughters with the mask right down. They walked in with a mask up through the security. As soon as she got in, she went, put it down. I was in civilian. I walked up to them and said, ma'am, can I just politely ask your daughter to put the mask up? The first thing she asked, who are you? And I said, I'm a police officer. And he said, are you on duty? And I said, I'm the police commissioner. I'm never off duty. And at that instant, she put it, put it on. Is that the type of responsibility we want to show our young people? or should we do it all together? We have to work together, as clearly uh, intimated. So if you are responsible about things and doing things right, you need not worry about anything. But if you are irresponsible, I can say things have been decided upon. As intimated this afternoon, El will be acting decisively on that. We're working uh, with uh, other stakeholders, Super City Council and Transport Authority, and answer other municipalities. Schools will be sending out uh, community policing uh, unit again to talk to, uh, to the schools, uh, revisiting what we've done before. As the minister has clearly indicated, we've been through this for two years. And the attitude, the general attitude has to change. And that's the line where we're coming from. People may be worried about the weather conditions that we are going through. The good news is that the, uh, the director and the MO and the team have worked together on an SOP that uh, uh, we have copies of now that we'll be also in, uh, enforcing at the evacuation centers. So that's pretty well covered. It's about people being responsible and following what the Minister and the Permanent Secretary for Health has intimated this afternoon. I'll be available for questions later if you do have questions. Thank you. So could you please specify what are informal gatherings? Could you please give some examples of it? It's though it's if you just uh, look at it in terms of a regulated environment and an unregulated environment. If you look at the hotels, they are within a regulated environment in terms of having the CFC. Uh, they all have the CFC commitments that they signed up to. So it's actually a regulated environment. We're talking about uh, informal settlements. You know the stuff that you sitting around grog bowl in an informal settlement, whether it's a. a, a uh, anywhere at the end of the day. It's not something that's organized. It's somewhere that we are not regulating. It's not somewhere which is actually sitting within the confines of uh, you being certified to open. 
certification from opening. So it's just regulated environment, unregulated environment. The unregulated environment is the informal settlements, informal uh, gatherings. That's all. Okay, so we, we have found that, you know, that's not something that we, we are able to police and we're asking all the citizens to stand up and be counted and just think about all your other fellow citizens. Be responsible, follow the COVID safe practices that have been uh, mentioned by Dr. Fong. That's all. So both informal and formal environments have chances of uh, transmission of cases spreading. So what's the rationale behind um, regulate, well, having stricter restrictions for informal gatherings? For, for formal gatherings, you, you are actually within the ambit of a set of guidelines that you must follow. Those guidelines exist. If, if, the, if the place that you've actually got a formal gathering, they don't follow the guidelines, they, 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 they lose their permit to operate. But informal gatherings, we don't have any regulation around them. That's what I mean. It's, it's really the Joe citizen being responsible within an informal environment. Whether you're having a, a small function at home and there's about 50 people, you know, um, sharing some drinks or, or, or having a feed or whatever, just those environments. Okay. Good. Anybody else? Lithia Dava from the Fiji Times. Uh, just in terms of uh, the bookings, are we still on track to get uh, those targeted numbers by the end of this month, or has it been affected, and by how much? Bookings. Tourist arrivals, yeah. Uh, nothing's changed. So I have a we question. You, are, you, you, are you referring to cancellations? Yes, sir. No, no, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. I think most people find Fiji a wonderful destination to come to and then continue to do so, and we must have also actually remember that. Our economy just just is just starting to get back onto track somewhat within the tourism industry and I think everybody needs to realize that everybody has a part to play. So this is in terms of uh, what you stated about uh, the open reopening of schools. Uh, last week we've had uh, unconfirmed reports of students and teachers getting sick. Does the ministry have a record of those and what are we doing about it? Yeah, um, uh, I think I've responded to this uh, in the written media also. We've recorded cases in every sector of employment. Teachers, doctors, nurses, uh, all the various ministries. We've got cases in every sector of employment. There's nothing special about the school sector, getting positive cases. We have, this is one of the reasons why we, have, why we wanted, we advised the uh, Ministry of Education to go with gradual opening. That was for us to start practicing some of the SOPs that are required to be implemented when you get one. So that you just do enough to sort out the case and whatever close contacts you have and protect the school environment. That's the reason why it was gradual opening. So there are measures in place to deal with that scenario. And the fact that it has occurred is not surprising at all for us. My second question says uh, just on the current infections, uh, and if you have a record on uh, how it can be attributed to uh, uh, international travelers, uh, because yeah. how, how much of the current high infection is because of uh, like cases from border cases? Do you have a record of that? Because initially we only recorded two cases, border uh, Omicron two cases, and then suddenly yeah. it's in the community. We've hadn't had any explanation of how it got to the community. Maybe just the brief outlook on how. See, this is where, where people make a mistake. They see that the number of cases we report is actually the number of cases that we have. And this is what I keep on trying to explain to everybody. What we report is what we see. Okay. Now, you all know that Omicron, the day we reported it, the very day we reported it, it was already in our quarantine facility. The day it was reported, it was already in many of our travel partner countries. Nobody knew that it was there. We only got aware of it after we started opening. So it is totally of no surprise to me that we had Omicron in our community. And we cannot attribute it just to the opening. This is the very natural way that highly transmissible viruses happen. All our border quarantine measures are focused on only one big thing. What we want to avoid is a variant coming into Fiji that the rest of the world has not yet known about. Because that's very damaging. If we become the focus of the first variant identified, 
all the initial punitive measures that they do against countries will start from there. So that is what we want to avoid. And that's why most of our protocols are we targeting uh, red listed countries with escalated pre departure protocols and we targeting them with highly with longer quarantine measures. But that's what we're targeting. So I think that the question of whether opening the borders contributed to Omicron is really not relevant in this space because of the high transmissibility of the virus. I personally think that it was here even before those two cases came in. Um, you're saying that uh, we need to get our vex rates up and get the boosters when we are due. Um, what about the large number of children who are unvaccinated? Many of these children are below the age of 12 and they will be beginning school soon um, when, when the weather situation improves. Okay, well, uh, I think a lot of your questions you're beginning to ask now needs to be part of a press conference that's mediated by education. Eh? Um, I would rather we stay away from the topic because this is a press conference that we want to discuss some of the changes that we have in place to facilitate our ability to live with the virus. Uh, I do know, let me just make it one short uh, statement I have to make is, I think we need to understand education is important, I've said that. We need to protect that space. That means there will be plenty of things that will allow to happen in that space and if we make sure that the space around it is well protected, that space becomes a low risk space. Okay? And that's what we have done now. We've escalated our ability to make, to, uh, to dish out uh, punitive measures on those who disobey the, uh, the, the, law, the mandates that we've made. We've announced a few of the other conditions uh, for business houses that they have to comply with. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create a safe zone so that those two spaces remain as least disturbed as possible. Now, the other question you ask, you need to talk to UNICEF. They have, and uh, WHO, they very clearly have defined for us that the type of receptors in the nose of children is much, much less. The receptors that are required for viruses to get on, latch onto and infect them, much, much less than that around them. So if you have people around them who, have, uh, who are slowing the transmission, and then you have a group of people that have a less risk of getting the virus, they are better off. Okay, but at the end of the day, we always have to play a uh, nuanced role in doing risk benefit. And if we want to have zero risk, well, the zero risk part is in the hands of each and every individual, the parents and those around our children. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, <coughs> these guys are to head off to NDMO. Appreciate you all being here this afternoon. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. <coughs>